And this big musical adventure took place in Chicago, the Windy City. It whistles, it talks, it moans, it groans, and all the while it's doing those things, it's blowing that air. In the first half of the 20th century, migrants, both black and white, blew into Chicago, attracted to its more liberal atmosphere and the chance to change their lives. Amongst these hundreds of thousands of immigrants included Muddy Waters from Mississippi and Leonard Chess from Poland. It was a typical immigrant story. My uh, family came from a small town in Poland. Like all immigrants, they came to America to make money, and it, it was a better life. Black Americans also moved to Chicago, fleeing the racism of the southern states. The whole feel of that era was one of a rush to freedom, at least a rush to less oppression. The job opportunities were there. If you worked at the post office in Chicago at that time, you was big doo-doo. Well, I ain't from Chicago, I'm from a little town. No, I ain't from To the black migrants moving up from the south, Chicago was an exciting new world. It was a booming city, a lot of action. You went into a club, everybody was from either Tennessee, Mississippi, Georgia, Texas, or New Orleans. And the common ground was, it, was it from the South, and they loved the blues. Let's go to Chicago, because you can, you can start to make real money there. Of course, what you didn't realize was that you, you were, you were going to work in some very, very hard circumstances. But look at those clubs. I mean, the opportunity to sort of, you know, down tools and play. In 1945, right at the end of World War II, Leonard Chess, a 28-year-old Jewish entrepreneur, was looking for business opportunities and spotted one within this black Chicago world. He opened this liquor store in a rough, black, ghetto neighborhood, and that's where he got his first inkling of uh, black people loving to buy alcohol to party, and that's where he saw the next step. Leonard's next business move was to open a bar with live music, the Macomba Lounge in 1947. A black nightclub, um, a hangout for jazz musicians, for prostitutes, pimps, drug dealers. I'm going fishing, baby. Marshall Chess remembers his father, Leonard, taking him to the Macomba Lounge when he was just five years old. There were gunshots, and my father threw me across the bar to my uncle, who laid on top of me on the floor on these wooden slats, you know, with stale alcohol and old cigarette smell. Out juicing all night, you come home stew. Leonard was a gambling man. He regularly moved within Chicago's Jewish poker circles. And this is where he met businesswoman Evelyn Aaron. In 1947, Evelyn invited Leonard to join her new record label, Aristocrat. It was here this white Polish salesman met a 31-year-old black musician from Mississippi, Muddy Waters. Their friendship would shape the rest of their lives and play a key part in the growth of chess records. They just met each other at the right time, the beginning of both of their moves toward a better life, and both driven, and both leaders. I mean, I think the money once told me that my father was one of the first white men that he ever really had a true friendship with. That was something my father felt very comfortable about, his black people. I, I used to tease him and say, you're more comfortable around blacks than whites. He says, you know, in some ways, you're right, you know. In Chicago in the late 1940s, the acoustic country blues of the black southern migrant was starting to change. To compete with the sounds of the big city, the musicians were embracing amplifiers and electric guitars, transforming the blues into a tougher, louder urban blast. It just became a practical reality that, you know, once you get into a bar, you know, a club, um, it became hard to, to hear the band, you know? So they just had to plug in. You got a lot of people in a small space, 
and people are celebrating it loud and they want to get it popping. Leonard's new friend, Muddy Waters, was at the forefront of this new emerging urban blues style. In 1948, when he was making his very first recordings for Aristocrat Records, Muddy made a crucial breakthrough in the birth of electric blues in Chicago. There had been recordings with electric guitar before, but it, it tended to be an adjunct. I can't be satisfied. It was like, you know, Wow, <laughs> the, the guitar was up there with the voice. It was, it was a lot of what the record is about, is that thing. Dam, dam, dam. He's playing it just like he would originally played it on an acoustic, but now he's got that exciting element of the an electric guitar. So this is country blues that's uh, come to town. There were guitarists who could play really well acoustic, but they couldn't make that transition. It just didn't work on electric for them. But Muddy managed to come up with this style that, that really crystallised this whole thing, which made it his character for him and what he was trying to project. If it's done in 1948, it's even more astonishing. That sort of was like... Um, perked up the ears of a lot of kids around the country says, what is that? Well, I'm gonna wait to leave. Won't be back no more. In 1949, when Evelyn Aaron left Aristocrat, Leonard and his brother Phil took a gamble and bought the label outright. One year later, the brothers gambled again, relaunching Aristocrat as Chess Records. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Leonard and Phil, opposites. A very typical two brother situation. My Uncle Phil laid back, smoking those big cigars. My father, the older brother, driven, possessed. Two different personalities, and they knew it. Well, I wish. Leonard had the initiative. Leonard was the one who had the sharper vision. Phil helped him execute it. And, and again, I think that the enterprise probably wouldn't have been the same if it had just been Leonard by himself with, with trusted hired help. The fact that it was Leonard and Phil made it special. Leonard and Phil released the first blues hit on their new chess label in 1950. Rolling Stone by Muddy Waters. I went to. It was hitting everywhere. It was all over Chicago. Rolling Stone. Muddy Waters says it. He really made chess, and chess really made him. And the very early success of Muddy Waters really inspired both my uncle and Muddy Waters. I don't want you to be no slave. Although the recording of Rolling Stone was just electric guitar and bass, Muddy's live club band was larger, and he was keen to bring them into the recording studio. At first, the Chess Brothers were reluctant to break the successful formula. They eventually relented and allowed Muddy to record his club band on masterpieces like I Just Want to Make Love to You. And that began the archetype of what the rock and roll band would become, you know? Uh, the bass, uh, the guitar, uh, a keyboard, you know, drums. That sort of configuration was pretty much created by the Muddy Waters band. When it came down to Muddy Waters putting together a band, that total sound is, is really what got the crowd moving and rocking. He sounded, it sounds some kind of like a lion, you know, you can imagine with a big mane and it somehow sound like that. You had a combination of, of Muddy Waters, who were bold, and you had a grass dude like Leonard Chess, and together they had a combination that said, hey, let, let's go get it. The promotion that Leonard Chess gave Muddy Waters allowed him to play at bigger black venues in Chicago. One of the city's most famous disc jockeys, Herb Kent, witnessed Muddy's growing popularity. In all the, the areas that we were playing, I just want to make love to you. People came out and they were dancing and doing the hoochie coochie. I will never forget that. I began to really understand that at, at that point, Chicago was a blues 
town. Muddy's band included harmonica player and blues bad boy, Little Walter. In 1952, at the end of a recording session for chess, Muddy allowed Little Walter to cut an instrumental called Duke. From then on, it became essential for Chicago blues bands to include an amplified harmonica in their lineup. He was sort of the Eric Clapton or you know, Jeff Beck, uh, uh, the job they would serve in the Yardbirds. You know, the Walter was the was the Flash. You know, he was the he was the uh, yeah, he did the killer solos. You know, Juke was a masterpiece. It was just it was just, a, just a great creative uh, piece of work that he, he came up with. But Leonard Chess was unsure of when to release Little Walter's Duke. A couple of months after the recording, Leonard played the song in the office. As he turned up the volume, Leonard watched the women outside on the street start to dance. It was an immediate sign to my father and everyone, rush this out, rush this out, you know. He always used to like to watch the response of his audience. After the success of Duke, Little Walter went solo, recording a number of blues hits for chess that sometimes even outsold Muddy's own releases for the label. One of them was called Boom Boom, Out Go the Lights. No kidding, I'm ready to fight. I've been looking for my baby all night. If I get up in my sight, boom, boom, out go the light. He was sort of that archetype rock and roller, you know, he was the one getting their fights and obviously a song from the heart, you know what I mean? That, this is what was going on in his life. You had no problem believing that, you know? Like. When I first heard that record, I was like, I shook my head, I said, man, I can't believe it. It's like he's really talking about if his woman goes out for the night, you know, he find her, you know, whatever, he might forgive her, but boom, boom, I'm a knock her out. And I was like, whoa. Like hip hop, Early electric blues reflected the mood of the black ghetto, of the neighborhood, the problems. There weren't psychiatrists or psychologists for black people. It showed you exactly the, the, the time, time and the period of what was acceptable, which is crazy. But also it showed you how crazy little Walter was. Boom, boom, out go the light. As the music developed in Chicago, Leonard worked night and day conducting huge sweeping tours of the southern states, where he charmed local DJs, distributors and retailers. This was essential to the label's commercial growth, and the South became Chess's biggest market outside of Chicago. The United States still had legally sanctioned segregation, so when Leonard went down south, he was a white man. He could indeed go any place he wanted. He didn't have to determine, can I stay in this hotel? Can I get gas at this station? Do I have to get my food from the back at this restaurant if they will even, even serve me? Leonard, like other Jewish immigrants in the States, had experienced racial prejudice and empathized with the plight of black Americans. I think they had a real soft spot for black people who were feeling the same thing as they felt. They knew how it felt, but they knew they had the edge by being white. It was Leonard, the white businessman, who searched for new black musical talent during these trips. Once, when visiting chess distributor and friend Stan Lewis in Louisiana, Leonard came face to face with the racism of the South. I called Leonard and I said, Leonard, I got a, a good blues singer by the name of Stick Horse Hammond. He was owned by the, the owner of the plantation. So we drove up this big mansion, and this man came out with his shotgun. And I said, sir, do you have a guy by the name of Stick Horse Hammond? And I says, I have a friend here, Leonard Chess, that wants to make a big store out of him. And he stuck a shotgun in my stomach. 